Welcome to today's very special Relapsing Polychondritis 101 webinar. My name is Kaylin Young and I'm the Director of Research Affairs for the Vasculitis Patient Powered Research Network and the Vasculitis Foundation. Today we have a spectacular panel to share with us their expertise and knowledge about relapsing polychondritis or RP. Our physician experts presenting an overview of this disease are the talented Dr. Banerjee and Dr. Farada. Dr. Banerjee is an assistant professor of clinical medicine and the division of rheumatology at the University of Pennsylvania, she, where she works at the Penn Vasculitis Center and leads the Penn Relapsing Polychondritis Program with Dr. Merkel. And Dr. Farada was trained in clinical care and infectious disease with a background in basic science research prior to her internal medicine residency. Dr. Farada currently conducts translate translational research and RP and has a very intimate connection to the disease. In August of 2015, Dr. Ferrada was diagnosed with relapsing polychondritis and has harnessed her clinical expertise with her passion for advancing RP research. We also have an exceptional panel of patient experts speaking with us today. First, we have Nancy Lin, a patient with the RP and the director and chair of the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation. Nancy produced RP, The Ride of Fine Life, a documentary about her battle with relapsing polychondritis. She also founded the Race for RP to advance research and the pursuit of treatments and cures for relapsing polychondritis and other autoimmune diseases. We also have Victor James, a patient with GPA and member of the Board of Directors for the Vasculitis Foundation, as well as Michael Lynn, who is the Director and Vice Chair of the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation, an avid advocate for RP research through collaboration. I've had the privilege of working with Mr. Lynn and the RP Foundation on our recent vasculitis COVID-19 patient project and can speak to his stalwart dedication to advancing RP research. And finally, we have Isabel Batista, a patient with relapsing polychondritis and dedicated advocate who recently led an international campaign to combat COVID-19 and increase awareness of relapsing polychondritis. She and her team of patients and supporters produce over 300 custom cloth masks with RP logos, which were donated to patients across nine different countries. With this incredible panel, of clinical experts and patient experts. We hope you enjoy the webinar and have a great experience learning about relapsing polychondritis. Thank you, Kaylin, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here today to talk to you about these two diseases. Today, we're going to talk about granulomatosis with polyangitis, or GPA, and relapsing polychondritis, of RP. And as a patient, you probably are asking yourself why you should listen to this webinar. Right, sit here and listen to us for the next 40 minutes or of an hour where there is a lot of information that I think that you will be interested in knowing. So for patients with uh, granulomatosis with polyanditis, we are going to be talking about diagnosis and the history of the diagnosis. And we're also going to be talking about the history of treatment development. And I think that this is probably very exciting for you as a patient to know, uh, know how everything happened and how um, we got to the point that you were able to receive the treatments that you're currently receiving and also exciting news that maybe you're not aware of that Dr. Banerjee is going to be sharing with you. For patients with relapsing polychondritis, we're going to be also talking about diagnosis and we will be discussing future directions and how we uh, are, as a team are going to work to get where granulomatosis with polyangitis is. So we wanna uh, use the example of granulomatosis with polyangitis uh, um, to show how we have been working as a teamwork. And at this moment, you probably are asking yourself why we decided to talk about granulomatosis with polyangitis and relapsing polychondritis in the same webinar. And the reason that we decided to do that is because there is a lot of clinical manifestations that are similar between patients that have relapsing polychondritis and granulomatosis with polyanditis. So over time, we would like for patients that have these two conditions to get to know each other and uh, help each other and support each other since I think, and I suspect that uh, 
you you both have been through the same path and had the same difficulties with diagnosis as well as uh, treatment and treatment complications. And as I was saying before, we would like to use the example of granulomatosis with polyangitis um, as how working uh, as a team uh, was a, a history of success. And you are, guys are going to see that through the presentation. And at the end of the presentation, we're going to have time for questions. And we're also going to share some links of how you can participate in research. So with all of that, I would like to start with a clinical case. And this was a 42-year-old female with left ear pain, swelling, and redness. She also had dry cough and shortness of breath, as well as left rib cage pain and nasal bridge redness pain and swelling. So does this patient has DPA or relapsing polychondrites? We'll see. Her laboratory, her laboratory testing, I'll, I'll show you in the next few slides, but before that, I would like to show you the pictures of what we saw in the physical exam. And as you can see in this picture, uh, she had something known by some of you called saddle nose deformity. She also had an MRI that demonstrated inflammation of the trachea, which is highlighted by the arrow. So if you see that a wide area in here, that should not be there. Uh, so this is inflammation of the trachea or, or windpipe. She also had uh, something called subglottic stenosis, which is also inflammation in the upper part of the airway and is highlighted by this arrow. Um, and as I was telling you before, the laboratory testing that she had demonstrated that she did not have ANCA antibodies. So what would be the diagnosis in this patient? Um, she had relapse in polychondritis. So with that um, case, I would now let uh, Dr. Banerjee continue with the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Ferrada. I would like to thank the Vasculitis Foundation and the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation for this wonderful webinar. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, I'm going to start with a case. Uh, our patient was a 43-year-old woman who was having dry cough and was also having difficulty in breathing. And this is how her ear looked like. It was, uh, it was red, it was painful and swollen. And as you can see, it did not involve the lower part of the lobe of the ear. Many of you in the audience, particularly those who have relapsing polychondritis are probably um, aware of this uh, clinical manifestation and must be thinking that this patient probably have relapsing polychondritis. So let's go over the imaging and the blood work that this patient had. She had an MRI of her airway, which showed airway inflammation, tracheal inflammation, very similar to the picture that Dr. Ferrada showed. And she also had the narrowing of the airway, again, similar to the picture that Dr. Ferrada showed you. And for comparison here, uh, this is the normal airway. As you can see, our patient's airway was narrowed, stenosed compared to the normal. In addition, the patient also had a CAT scan of the chest, which showed that she had some nodules or some masses in her lungs. Laboratory tests showed her ANCA antibodies were positive and her anti-PR3 antibodies were high. So by now, many of you in the audience, those who have ankyl vasculitis, know that this patient had granulomatosis with polyangitis. So from the two cases, it is evident that patients with relapsing polychondritis and with granulomatosis with polyangitis have a lot of common clinical manifestations. So let's compare and contrast. So in both the diseases, there is involvement of the airway, the respiratory system, as we call it. Uh, nasal crusting, bleeding, saddle nose deformity, sinusitis are very common in GPA and also seen in relapsing polychondritis, nasal crusting and saddle nose. External ear swelling is a hallmark manifestation in RP and probably Many of you with GPA do not know that 
a small percentage of patients with GPA can have external ear swelling, which looks exactly like the patients in RP. Hearing loss in both the diseases, airway narrowing and difficulty in breathing um, can be present in both the diseases. However, lung nodules, bleeding in the lungs, coughing up blood, these things are present, can be present in patients with GPA, but usually not seen in relapsing polychondritis. Eye inflammation uh, can be present in both the diseases, whereas kidney involvement, which is a common and a severe manifestation in uh, GPA, is almost never seen in relapsing polychondritis. Skin rash can present in both the diseases and general manifestations like weight loss, fever, joint pain, muscle aches can, can be present in both GPA and RP. Ribcage pain, which happens because of inflammation of the cartilage, osteochondritis, is very commonly present in relapsing polychondritis, but usually not in GPA. Before we talk about more about how do you make the diagnosis uh, for GPA and relapsing polychondritis, uh, I would like to talk about briefly about some of the parts of the body that get affected in these two diseases. Both uh, uh, diseases can have uh, involvement of the upper airway. In here, the, as uh, Dr. Banerjee and I show you, patients with RP and GPA can have inflammation of the windpipe, including subglottic stenosis. And also the sinuses, both diseases can have inflammation in there as well. And uh, for patients that have relapsing polychondritis, uh, they tend to have more inflammation in the cartilaginous structures, and that is going to be the trachea and the bronchi. So it's basically the tubes that go down into your lungs, these tubes. And the trachea and the bronchi, they both have cartilage. I believe that the distal airway in RP can also be affected, although those structures don't have cartilage. But that is basically uh, what happens in relapsing polychondritis. And when these structures get inflamed, they get floppy, and, and that's called tracheomalacia or bronchomalacia. Now, for patients that have GPA, they have a inflammation more in the vasculature. So if you look at this picture, so in the distal, distal aspect of the lungs, there is a structure called an alveoli. And around the alveoli, uh, there are vessels that include the arterioles and the venules. And when these get inflamed, they can bleed. And they bleed into the lung, and that's why when it bleeds into the lung, the alveoli, it goes to the troops, and that's why patients that have GPA tend to cough blood. It's because of the inflammation in the vessels around the distal parts of the lung, and then that is why uh, when you have GPA, the doctor tells you that you have nodules that is due to inflammation in the lung tissue, secondary to the inflammation in the vessels. In terms of the clinical suspicion for the two diseases, for patients that have granulomatosis or polyangitis, as, as we said uh, before, and Dr. Banerjee, Banerjee pointed out, they tend to have more inflammation in the tissue of the lungs, secondary to the bleeding in the, those little vessels that I show you. And they also tend to have inflammation in the kidneys, and that is also secondary to the inflammation in the vasculature, whereas patients that have relapsing polychondritis have more inflammation in the cartilaginous structures that are part of the breathing tubes and also the cartilage that gets attached from the uh, ribs into the sternum, the bone in your chest, the chest bone. And as you can see, the cartilage gets um, all the way down. So the costochondritis, which is the pain that you get in the chest due to inflammation of the cartilage, is not only in the anterior part, but also in the lower part of the rib cage. So it's very important for physicians to have clinical suspicion to be able to make the diagnosis. That is a, one of the, the first steps, right, for the physician or for the patient, right? If you're having all of these symptoms and, and then uh, you're able to lay the symptoms out to the physician, that is going to be very helpful 
for the doctors to make the diagnosis. And that is particularly important for patients that have relapsing polychondritis. And the reason that it is very important, particularly for RP, is because the diagnosis of RP is mainly uh, done with secondary to all the clinical symptoms. And I'm just going to show you briefly what are the clinical symptoms of relapsing polychondritis. So ear chondritis means inflammation or redness, pain, and swelling of the ears. Um, and nose chondritis is inflammation of the nose, so nose pain and redness, or if you the crusting and ulcers. Respiratory tract chondritis can go from the subleuric stenosis of so narrowing that uh, I show in the previous case, or the inflammation on the trachea, the tubes that I show you, the the trachea and the bronchi, that would be the respiratory tract chondritis. Uh, patients can also have inflammation on the joints that do not, will not damage the joints. That is, is why it's called non-erosive. Inflammation in the eyes and audio vestibular involvement, which is basically uh, the symptoms that uh, patients with this will have will be hearing loss and dizziness and also tinnitus. And then if you have three of these symptoms, you will have a diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis. And that is the McAdams criteria. The Damianis criteria, added having one of those symptoms with a biopsy showing inflammation around the cartilage. And we will talk about biopsy in the next few, few slides. And uh, or having two of the clinical symptoms, two out of the six. And if you're giving prednisone or steroids or dapsone, well, prednisone is steroids. So if you get prednisone and you feel better, or if they give you Dapsone and you feel better, then you will also, that will also be part of the criteria for relapsing of polychondritis if you use the Damianis criteria. So as you can see, um, the clinical symptoms for making the diagnosis in relapsing polychondritis is, is very important. And the reason that Dapsone is included there is because, as I'm going to show you next, uh, the Damianis criteria was made um, in the 1970s. In terms of the biopsy, how do you make the diagnosis for the biopsy for a granulomatosis with polyangitis? Um, what you're going to see is inflammation in the artery, the vessel, or the area around the vessel, that is the perivascular area that we call, and that is in uh, these different organs, so in the kidney, the skin, or the lung. And um, the biopsy for uh, diagnosis in granulomatosis with polyangitis is very helpful. So when patients have symptoms that suggest granulomatosis with polyangitis, uh, many times they will have a biopsy because these have been shown to be very helpful to establish diagnosis. So how about biopsy for relapsing polychondritis? So usually this is when I'm talking about if you get a biopsy from a cartilage and it's usually the ear or the trachea, there is going to be inflammation around the cartilage, right? And we um, have found that it may be not that helpful. And one of the reasons is because as I show you in, in previous slides, the diagnosis is made uh, based on clinical symptoms. Uh, so sometimes you don't need to hire, have a biopsy. Now, um, these should be taken uh, patient by patient because there are some of the patients where the diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis um, was made with a biopsy. Uh, this is uh, sometimes can happen when other symptoms are not being recognized or when patients uh, have isolated involvement of one particular organ, like for example, if they don't have any other symptoms, but they have inflammation only in the trachea. So sometimes the biopsy can be helpful for the diagnosis. Um, and one of the cautions for a biopsy is that it can trigger inflammation uh, from the biopsy in patients with relapsing polychondritis. So then they can flare or that area can be um, very inflamed after the biopsy. So it can be helpful in some cases, but it's not as helpful as it is for patients with granulomatosis with polyangitis. And um, in terms of the blood test, so for granulomatosis with polyangitis, we have a well-established test called the ANCAT, and this is the anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic antibodies. And there are two of them. One is the PR3 and the other one is MPO. And these antibodies are very helpful for the diagnosis because about from 82 
or 85 to 94 percent of patients with this disease can have these antibodies in their blood. So it's very helpful for diagnosis. Uh, and for relapsing polychondritis, there is a blood test called the anti-collagen 2 antibody that was described also in the 1970s, where they had 15 patients, and from 15 patients, this is one five, five patients have this collagen 2 antibody elevated, and since then, uh, they believe was that this antibody was helpful for diagnosis. But we have found that it's actually not helpful for diagnosis. We have tested many of the patients that we have seen with relapsing polychondritis, and we have not seen a constant elevation of anticollagen 2 antibody, meaning that um, in patients that have confirmed relapsing polychondritis. So we don't think that uh, is helpful. And now we're going to talk about a little bit about the history of uh, GPA diagnosis. So the first case of GPA, the first description, because it was in a case, there were like several cases uh, from Frederick Wegener's was in 1936, and the name Wegener's granulomatosis um, uh, was uh, accepted in 1954, and then since then, from uh, 1982 to 1985, was when the ANCAS were associated with GPA, meaning that they start seeing that the ANCAS were elevated a lot in patients that have GPA. Then from 1988 to 1989 is when they found these specific auto antibodies called the MPO and the PR3. And then in 1990 uh, is when they develop an ELISA, which is a special test that you do to measure these antibodies in the blood of the patients, and it became commercially available. So anybody could use this test to diagnose these patients. In 2011, the name was changed to granulomatosis with polyandritis. Then in 2012 uh, is when the introduction uh, acceptance of the ANCA, uh, PR3, and MPO antibodies uh, were uh, part of the vasculitis criteria. And currently, as I show you in the previous slides, the diagnosis of GPA uh, is based on the clinical suspicion, the symptoms, the blood test, and a biopsy knowing that the blood blood test has a good uh, sensitivity and specificity and the biopsy is also very helpful and let me talk to you now about the history of the diagnosis in rp so the first case of uh, relapsing polychondritis it was one case and it was this, it was uh, published in 1923 and i i really like to talk about this case because i find it very interesting so this was a 36 year old male that had a lot of uh, joint pains. He also was having uh, nose pain, ear pain. Uh, he was very debilitated. At that time, they were able to look at his airway, and he also had um, epiglottic, epiglottic inflammation. And the conclusion of the author of this case was that this patient developed relapsing polychondritis because he was drinking too much beer, because this patient happens to be a brewer, and he was drinking eight liters of beer per day probably because he was having a lot of pain. So, so far we have not been able to confirm that beer will give you relapsing polychondritis. I am not advocating for people to drink eight liters of beer per day. I'm just saying that uh, we have not seen an association with beer. Um, in 1960, the name uh, of relapsing polychondritis uh, started being accepted. The previous name was polychondropathia. And in 1976, uh, McAdams, um, Publish his diagnosis criteria that I show you in a previous slide. And then in 1979, it was the Damianis diagnosis criteria. And currently, these are the diagnosis criteria that we're using for relapsing polychondritis. I'm going to discuss the treatment options available for GPA and for RP. As Dr. Ferrada mentioned, the GPA was first described in literature in 1936. And the natural history of the disease was described in 1958. At that time, there was no treatment available for GPA. It was described as a universally fatal disease. Survival was around five months. In 1960, corticosteroids were introduced for the first time for treatment of GPA, and there was a modest improvement in the survival to up to eight months. 
And there was a radical change following that in the early 1970s when Dr. Anthony Fauci at the National Institutes of Health introduced cyclophosphamide for the treatment of uh, GPA, which led to 75% complete remission rate and almost 87% survival rate, which was very exciting. And Dr. Fauci also established a natural history cohort or a longitudinal cohort for patients with GPA at uh, the National Institutes of Health, which means that the patients uh, who were being followed at the NIH, um, if they were interested in research, their clinical data, blood samples, and tissue samples, if available, those were collected periodically. And that led to, to significant improvement in the understanding of the disease and paved the way for future research as well. Over time, we realized that although cyclophosphamide was greatly successful in the treatment of GPA, it was associated with a lot of side effects. For example, cystitis or inflammation of the urinary bladder, infertility, infections, including life-threatening infections, myelodysplasia or bone marrow abnormalities, cancers, and more than 50% relapse rate. In the following few decades, there were multiple clinical trials in GPA using different medications. Some of you in the audience may be familiar uh, with these drugs, some of the drugs like methotrexate, azathioprine, mycophenolate. Many of these trials were successful and we still use some of these medications for the treatment of this condition. The next landmark trial in GPA and ANCA-associated vasculitis in general was the use of rituximab for this condition. This is a less toxic drug than cyclophosphamide, and in the clinical trial setting, it was found to work as good as cyclophosphamide, which was very exciting, and that led to FDA approval of rituximab for the treatment of ANCA-associated vasculitis, including GPA. Uh, this is very exciting in the vasculitis world because rituximab was not only the first drug for GPA, but also the first drug which has ever been approved in any type of vasculitis. There are multiple ongoing clinical trials in GPA. There are new drugs which are being tested, including abatacept, Avacopan, IFX1. Some of you may have participated in some of these trials. There are ongoing trials on glucocorticoids. We are trying to determine the optimal dose, optimal duration of glucocorticoids, and also more trials on rituximab. Again, we are trying to understand uh, the optimum duration of rituximab treatment and what should be the frequency of rituximab administration. And this has been possible through teamwork, the tremendous amount of uh, collaborative work among the research networks, particularly the VCRC, which is the largest uh, research network dedicated to research in different types of vasculitis, along with patient advocacy group, particularly the Vasculitis Foundation, which is the largest patient advocacy group in the field of vasculitis. And the VCRC along with uh, the VF have led to multiple international collaboration and uh, industry sponsorship that has led to multiple clinical trials. The first ever treatment guidelines for vasculitis from the American College of Rheumatology, which was presented at the annual meeting of ACR last year, that was heavily influenced by the several clinical trials uh, over the last few decades. And that basically epitomizes the tremendous success in this field. So GPA, which was then described as a universally fatal disease within one year of diagnosis without treatment, is now a chronic disease with relapsing remitting course. Five-year survival is more than 80%. And the most exciting part is the fact that there are several ongoing research projects 
in this disease. So now moving on to relapsing polychondritis. As Dr. Ferrada mentioned, uh, the first description of a case of relapsing polychondritis is from 1923. And the term relapsing polychondritis was coined in 1960. Since then, multiple case reports and case series have been published. And uh, this, this, all these reports describe the use of glucocorticoids and some glucocorticoid sparing agents, including non-biologic agents like methotrexate, uh, mycophenolate, some biologic agents, for example, infliximab, adalimumab, for relapsing polychondritis with variable response rate. The initial response rate is around 60% whereas the remission rate remains really low at around 20%. So in 2020, we at this time, we do not have any clinical trial in relapsing polychondritis. We do not have any standardized treatment regimen. And unfortunately, uh, this disease still has a very high rate of disability and high rate of mortality. So a lot of work needs to be done to improve the outcome in relapsing polychondritis. Now, as we are talking about our outcome, I'm going to tell you briefly about measurement of disease outcome. So outcome measures are defined as tools to assess the effect of a treatment on patient's health. So basically, for example, if I have a patient with uh, relapsing polychondritis, and I give the patient a treatment A. I have to measure the disease before treatment A and after treatment A in order to understand if the treatment A was effective. It sounds very simple, but there are some complexities, some specificities associated with it. For like, this has to be very standardized and uniform so that the outcome measures can be used in multi-center clinical trials. And it includes various components. For example, we should be able to measure disease activity. I can give you the example of say nasal crusting, nasal discharge, that can be a measure of disease activity in GPA. And we should be able to measure damage or irreversible changes, for example, saddle nose deformity is a measure of disease damage. And patient reported outcome, which is very important, how the disease has affected your life, that needs to be measured as well. There are various outcome measures which are available in GPA and some which are available for RP as well. In GPA, we have standardized measurements of disease activity, uh, disease damage, and we have multiple patient reported outcomes, which includes symptom severity, the impact of problems and limitations affecting your life, and treatment response criteria, which is an ongoing project. So, and the important part is when these measures were being developed, we had international experts, researchers, uh, clinicians as well as patient representatives that helped a lot in the development of the outcome measures in GPA. In RP, we have a disease activity, we have disease activity index and we have disease damage index. Both the indices need some modification, some validation, and some of this work is uh, under development or being done by the international a relapsing polychondritis uh, research team and Dr. Ferrada is going to tell you more about it. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee. And as Dr. Banerjee was saying, it's so important to work as a team. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's, uh, none of this is possible, right? Um, and the purpose of everything that we're doing is to improve morbidity and increase survival in patients with relapsing polychondritis. And uh, I mean, for all the patients, I, of course, I'm, I'm biased. Uh, being a patient with relapsing polychondritis, so I'm, I'm really invested in uh, trying to um, make the life for patients with relapsing polychondritis better. 
and I wish we have a magic wand. And, I'm, and I think that many of the patients with relapsing polychondritis or any rare disease will also wish to have a magic wand to make everything happen very quickly, right? Because then um, it, there are all the tools that Dr. Banerjee mentioned to you that we don't have in relapsing polychondritis and there are no uh, specific treatments or treatment guidelines and, and all of these take time. So yes, I, I wish we could make all of this happen very quickly, like a magic wand, uh, but we don't have a magic wand. And we don't have a magic wand, but we have an amazing group of people from everywhere in the world. I, mean, I think that we're missing maybe some of the countries, but a lot of people that are physicians, researchers, patient representatives, patient advocates uh, that are going to be participating in this webinar. And uh, we are working as a team very hard to um, move the field in relapsing polychondritis forward. And let me share a little bit more uh, with you about what we have been doing. This picture is the picture of the first international relapsing polychondri polychondritis work group meeting. It was in November 2016, and it was a small group, but we have to start somewhere, right? And it was amazing, like a, like a dream, to see a group of people and to see how invested people were to work in making this disease better. And what had happened since 2016 until uh, 2020 with our International Polychondritis Research Network? Well, we have grown. We have a lot of uh, physicians and researchers now and more patient advocates from different countries as well. And we have more support. And uh, we have physicians from uh, multiple super specialities. We have adult rheumatology, pediatric rheumatology, dermatology, radiology, of course, pulmonology, um, ENT and ophthalmology. And as you can see, the uh, representation is from many different countries. And most importantly, we have the patient representatives being part of our group and advocates, because otherwise uh, this wouldn't be possible. And as Dr. Banner just showed you in GPA, uh, we need to work as a team. And we are, and we will make things happen. So I just think that this is a matter of time. Um, what else uh, we have been doing? Um, with the International Polychondritis Research Network. Uh, uh, one of the projects that we have been working is the classification criteria. And this project is very important because if we don't have a classification criteria, we won't be able to do clinical trials and get a medication approved. So we need to start you know, from the beginning to make things right. And we have been invited uh, to uh, do a full proposal for the American College of Rheumatology and the European um, uh, League Against Rheumatism for this year. And we, fingers crossed, we will get funded this year. And again, it's extremely important that we have the patient input to help with this project. And with the help of the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation and the Race for RP, we actually did a survey, online survey, that many of you probably participated. And we have close to 700 responses. And we're going to use your answers uh, or the answers of the patients that participated in this survey to be part of this project, to have your input in defining the organ involvement. And this is also very important because we want to ha have all the physicians to have the same understanding of what inflammation of the ear means. As Dr. Banerjee mentioned, we're also working on the Relapsing Polychondritis Disease Activity Index. This is a project that was started by Laurent Aron. He is an expert, expert in relapsing polychondritis, and he is from France. He also did a webinar recently that it was fantastic when he talks about uh, the disease. So if you get a chance to find him and, and see him, uh, you can email me uh, um, if you're interested, or, or I think the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation has the link. Um, but what we're currently doing is uh, with the help of the uh, International Polychondritis Research Network is to modify this index, to um, make it better. Make it better and validate it, which means that we will make it a tool that can be used by all the physicians that are seeing patients with relapsing polychondritis to assess the disease activity. And uh, Dr. 
uh, Laurent Aron also did the relapsing polychondritis damage index. He was uh, the lead also in this project. And we also plan uh, to consider modifying this index and validate it. So it could also be a tool that can be widely used to um, evaluate patients with relapsing polychondritis. Um, so we're working on it and then we're working as a team. And I just wanted to mention that the Relapsing Polychondritis Disease Activity Index, uh, the project has been moved forward, uh, particularly by a medical student. Her name is Emily Rose, and she has been fantastic. And without her help, we couldn't have been able uh, to move this project as fast as it has been moving. So we're very thankful uh, for her work and her perseverance. And, um, and again, teamwork. And now I'd like to share with you a little bit about our relapsing polychondritis natural history study at NIH. And um, I show you the picture of the magic wand. So for me, this is my magic wand because uh, we, I think that NIH has uh, all of the many resources that uh, can be helpful uh, to help understand the disease. Uh, of course, uh, any other centers and, and many other centers uh, that are interested in studying this disease are also, so every little center is a magic one because without this and understanding the disease and uh, seeing the patients, we, we, we won't be able to move forward the field. Uh, and um, we started our natural history protocol at the end of uh, 2016 with the help of a lot of people, particularly my mentor, Dr. Peter Grayson. He is the head of the translational vasculitis uh, program uh, at NIH, and we built this um, um, natural history protocol while I was doing my fellowship, so I had a, a lot of help. And um, in this slide, I'm just showing you where are our patients coming from. So we have patients from coming from many places to NIH. So we have patients from Canada, from um, Ireland, from Italy, from Lebanon, Latin America, and many places in the United States. And I may be missing dots in the United States, but um, I'm showing this slide because I um, wanted to thank all the patients that uh, have come to NIH to help with research because, again, without understanding the disease and, and seeing the patients and having the help of the patients, uh, we won't be able to uh, move forward and, and we need uh, uh, the patients, we need each other to help others and to help uh, ourselves. And uh, let me share with you what, what is the evaluation uh, that we do at NIH. So we do a clinical evaluation, and that includes um, laboratory tests, right, because we want to rule out GPA. We want to check for ANCA antibodies and, and check for other things. We do radiology tests. We do a hearing test, ENT. Patients are seen by any super specialist that is needed. And we are not the primary team of the patients, but we communicate with the local rheumatologists and the team. And I think that these clinical evaluations uh, and all, everything that we're doing, I think that is helpful for the patient directly uh, because we're doing it in a very short period of time. And we also give our recommendations and I hope we're, we're helping uh, our patients directly, but we're also uh, collecting all this clinical information to understand the disease over time and to develop those patient assessment tools that I mentioned to you uh, before, the, the disease activity, and to develop more patient assessment tools that can be used uh, in the future uh, for patients with relapsing polychondritis. And in terms of research, we collect blood and we do other imaging studies. And we do these because we want to uh, understand possible factors that could be associated with the disease, including genetic factors and environmental factors. We actually working in collaboration with UPenn, with um, Dr. Winnie Ree, looking at the microbiome. And, um, and we, um, uh, there may be some news in the future about um, some possible genetic associations. Uh, so I will leave that in the air. And we also want to develop diagnostic tools, right? I show you how in relapsing polychondritis, we do not have at the moment a blood test that can help us with a diagnosis, and that will be huge. And the other thing that we want to find is a test that can tell us when the patients with relapsing polychondritis are inflamed, 
because some patients with relapsing polychondritis will have inflammation and the inflammatory markers, uh, that is what your doctor will measure to see if your body is inflamed, can be normal. So if we can find something like that, that would be fantastic. If we can, no, I think that we will. And I think that is going to be a matter of time. Our team is a multidisciplinary team. So we have adult dermatologist, uh, Peter Grayson, as I mentioned to you before, he's an expert uh, in vasculitis and relapsing polychondritis, Dr. James Katz, um, which is the doctor that diagnosed me with relapsing polychondritis, Kaylin Quinn, which is an, also an expert in vasculitis, Wendy Goodspeed, that is uh, our research nurse and me. And then we have uh, also pediatric rheumatologist, ENT, pulmonology, GI, and uh, uh, Theo Heller is very interested in, in uh, the GI aspect of relapsing polychondritis. We also have a dermatologist uh, and a radiology that is part of our team. And I just want to share with you the manuscript, the first manuscript that came out recently from our cohort. So this is the, the first uh, description of our prospective cohort. And uh, we were able to find or uh, identify three different types of relapsing polychondritis. So the, the darker the color, the more percentage of involvement of the organ. So you see type 1 has a lot of ear involvement and airway involvement and uh, some eye. The type 2 is mainly airway, uh, but it also has inflammation in other areas, the patients. And then the type 3 uh, has mainly um, joint involvement more than anything and it can also have ear and eye involvement. And going back to our international group, um, we had our last meeting on November 9, 2019, and this meeting was fantastic because we were able to accomplish a lot uh, in terms of the projects that I mentioned to you before. And we haven't been able to do this meeting if we didn't have the support of the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation and the Race for RT. And then you can see here Dr. Banerjee here, and this is Nancy Lin. And then we had uh, we, we did a, a good work time during this meeting. So with all of that, I would like uh, now to uh, ask Nancy Lin to continue with the presentation. And before that, there is uh, the sentence that I like to say the most, and is uh, where there is research, there is hope, and we have research. And we do have research, and we're going to have more research. And uh, if you're a patient with relapse in polychondritis, Keep listening because there are going to be news coming up. Thank you, Dr. Ferrada. And thank you, Dr. Bandry. And thank you to the Vasculitis Foundation and everybody involved with this webinar today. I appreciate everybody's time and effort, everybody on this call and, and everybody listening. Again, my name is Nancy Lin and I am the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation Chair. And the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation is a patient-founded and patient-driven foundation. And we are very excited about this research that is happening. Our focus and purpose is to facilitate awareness, education, and research. We understand that RP, Relapsing Polychondritis, may be a form of vasculitis. And we are going to do everything that we can to aid in this research. Since we revitalized the foundation, we've seen a lot of growth with our teamwork and effort with the development of the International Relapsing Polychondritis Research Network. And we really care about patients and we are going to continue to drive awareness and accelerate research. And we work with a lot of drivers. We work with a lot of coaches. We work with a lot of techs and a lot of engineers. And they know that our cause is to facilitate research. And we are so thankful to the National Institutes of Health, the University of Pennsylvania, the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium, and the Vasculitis Foundation. My background is a nurse. I worked as a RN at a large university teaching hospital. I went on to do some healthcare administration for a large HMO. And then when I got my master's degree, I went on to do health promotion and health education. 
So I, I think that this is a wonderful collaborative group and I'm very, very, very pleased to be a part of it, to work with the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation board members and the Race for RP drivers and our, our, um, our crew. And I again, I, I thank you for everybody for being a part of this webinar today. And next I would like to introduce David Bamert. He is the president of the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you to everyone who helped put this webinar together. I'm, uh, I'm happy to be participating in the presentation today. I'd also like to specifically thank uh, Neil Langberg and Nancy and Mike Lynn for their unwavering commitment to the RP Foundation and Race for RP. Without their support, much of what I'm about to say would uh, not have occurred. Uh, in Dr. Ferrata's term, they have been our catalyst magic wands. So I'll take a few minutes to talk about the relationship between the RP Foundation and Race for RP. Structurally separate, the RP Foundation is a philanthropic organization that provides for the charitable operation of our efforts. Race for RP, on the other hand, is the awareness campaign that supports our messaging of facilitating research, increasing awareness, and improving care for those who are affected by RP and related diseases. I'll speak just briefly on awareness, collaboration, and philanthropic activity relative to our two organizations. First, awareness. A race for RP focuses attention on RP and initiatives benefiting patients, their families, and healthcare professionals. For example, those who follow us on social platforms will note that we use the tag driving awareness and accelerating research, as Nancy previously mentioned. This statement really underscores the role of race for RP in our messaging. Over the past two years, we have done this mainly through our collaboration with motorsports. It's also important to note at this point that to date, race for rp has been our largest contributor to the RP Foundation. Uh, moving on to collaboration, much of our success has been a result of our ability to build and maintain a global network of highly skilled and respected partners. This slide identifies some of our global collaborators. I should also mention that our global partners extend to our motorsport collaborators as well, as our Race for RP program is also international. Finally, I'll move to philanthropic activity. As I mentioned earlier, while separate, the RP Foundation is a philanthropic organization that provides for the charitable operation of our efforts. The foundation is a 501c3 charitable organization. The purpose of the foundation is to facilitate awareness, education, and research to improve the quality of life for patients with RP and advance a cure for this disease. Listed here are some of our funded collaborations that help to implement our purpose. Just two short years ago, prior to the significant restructuring of the foundation, the foundation operated with a budget of just a few thousand dollars. Last year, we ended our fiscal year closing in on a million dollars, a strong testament to the strategic vision of our two organizations working together. Now I'd like to turn the webinar back to Dr. Banjari, who will talk about one of our more recent funded programs. I'm going to uh, talk about the Penn Relapsing Polychondritis Program, which is a part of the Penn Vasculitis Center. The Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation helped tremendously in the establishment of the Penn RP Program. Uh, patients with suspected or confirmed relapsing polychondritis uh, will be able to get uh, clinical care through the Penn RP program. And the other arm of the program is research. And this is the phone number that the patients can call to make an appointment with one of our RP experts. This is our core rheumatology team consisting of uh, three physicians and one uh, nurse practitioner who are all experienced to see patients with relapsing polychondritis. And uh, we collaborate with uh, multiple specialists, including uh, ENT, radiology, ophthalmology, pulmonology, dermatology. And in addition, we also have uh, specialists in gastroenterology, gynecology as needed. The patients with uh, relapsing polychondritis are able to get continued care in a coordinated fashion under the umbrella of the Penn Relapsing Polychondritis Program. In addition to medical care, all investigations, for example, blood work, 
audiology, other uh, therapeutic or diagnostic procedures such as uh, laryngoscopy, bronchoscopy, cosmetic surgery if necessary are all available through the PEN-RP program. The other arm of the program is research, and we are collaborating with the National Institutes of Health Relapsing Polychondritis Program. We are establishing a relapsing polychondritis longitudinal cohort very similar to the natural history cohort that Dr. Ferrada uh, was discussing. This is going to be an excellent resource of clinical data linked with biospecimen for research. Patients with relapsing polychondritis, if they're interested in research, their clinical data along with blood samples and tissue samples whenever available will be collected uh, periodically. That will help in the better understanding in the disease and further our understanding, as well as pave the path for future research for better diagnosis and um, medications for this uh, disease. And as an example of a collaborative research, collaborative research work, I would like to mention about the tremendous success of our ongoing research project, the vasculitis COVID-19 patient project. The VCRC Vasculitis Foundation and the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation all were heavily in, involved in this project. And we got a tremendous response from the patients. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the participants. We had more than 700 patients um, for the baseline survey. There were many patients with granulomatosis with polyangitis and many patients with uh, relapsing polychondritis who participated in the baseline survey. And as I said, this is an ongoing project. We are still collecting data. It is, it, I, I really like this picture because it's showing where we're going and then we're going forward. I, again, we have a fantastic group of people. And then you saw uh, from uh, Nancy Lean and, and David Bummer how, uh, how we have a lot of support not only from many uh, places around the world, including researchers and investigators. But again, we have patients as well as patients that are participating in a research and patient advocates. Uh, and we also have um, the support of the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation and the Race for RP. And now uh, we have this opportunity to do this webinar with the Vasculitis Foundation. So thank you for giving us the opportunity uh, to do this webinar. And for the patients that have relapsing polychondritis, when you get very sick, just look, just think about the picture, right? When you, you were moving forward and you have a lot of people that are thinking uh, about you and trying to make things better for you and the new patients that are going to um, have relapsing polychondritis. So with that, uh, we want to um, open up for uh, some questions. Uh, and in here, you will see the phone number again for the Penn Vasculitis Center and Relapsing Polychondritis Program, and then the NIH Vasculitis Translational Research and Relapsing Polychondritis Program. Uh, that is the email for our research nurse. And uh, down here, there are the websites uh, that we think that could be helpful for you, including the Vasculitis Foundation that you pro probably already know uh, since you're listening to these webinar, but if you want to share that and the relapsing polychondritis um, um, a, a direction as well. And there is also an address a here that is a, for research. So if you're interested in participating in research, this is one of the resources that you could use and also more resources in the race for RP. My name is Isabel Bautista, and I'm a patient that suffers from RP, relapsing polychondritis. And my first question is, is there a particular criteria a patient has to meet to be accepted into the UPenn or any NIH program? And what is the process to get in? So I can answer that uh, question for the relapsing, for the relapsing polychondritis program at NIH. Um, um, we are seeing any patient that have a diagnosis of relapsing polychondritis already established or any patient that have a suspicion of relapsing polychondritis. And uh, once you email our research nurse, uh, she usually sends a letter 
with uh, further information about the program and then um, I will review the records and then there is a screening process that we have to go through. So, so for the UPenn program, um, we, are, we will be seeing any patient with suspected or confirmed uh, relapsing polychondritis and uh, you can call in the number that is listed on the screen to make an appointment with one of the um, RP specialists, one of the rheumatologists in the RP program. And uh, continued care is available. We follow patients longitudinally over time. If uh, someone wants a one-time consult and wants to go back to their local rheumatologist, we work with the local rheumatologists as well. Hello, my name is Victor James. I'm a patient with granulomatosis with polyangiitis. And a question I have as a patient is, what can I do individually to help with research or to reach out to other patients that suffer from the same condition that I have? So um, there are many ways that you can help patients with uh, GPA, right? And, and also patients with RP now that, um, if, probably many patients realize that they have the same clinical manifestations, right? So one of the ways that you can help other patients with uh, your condition is participating in research. Um, uh, as I uh, mentioned before, I think that that is very important uh, to help other people. And there are many ways that you could participate in research. So you could go either to the Penn Vasculitis Center or to NIH, or you could also um, it can do research through the Vasculitis Foundation. Uh, my next question is, given the fact that RP treatment and diagnosis criteria is so outdated, do you think there is an approximate time frame for RP to reach a relevant similar level of success as GPA? Thank you, Isabel, for this question. Um, this is a difficult uh, question to answer. As uh, we were um, you know, discussing, the time frame in GPA uh, was like from early 1970s, we found the first successful drug and uh, we are still learning. We have made a huge progress. However, there is you know, a long way to go even now. We are still learning. So we have a good team in relapsing polychondritis and uh, everybody's working together to help to understand the disease and uh, to improve the process of diagnosis and treatment as well. But it is very difficult to say how long it's going to take um, to, you know, to understand the disease or to find a better way to diagnose or an FDA approved drug in uh, relapsing polychondritis, but I can tell you that uh, a lot of smart people are working together and we are hopeful. The symptoms between the two diseases, RP and GPA, are, are similar from onset and looking at them. Is it possible for a patient to have both GPA and RP? I do not think that uh, someone can have both GPA and relapsing polychondritis together, but definitely, you know, misdiagnosis or difficulty in the diagnosis is possible, particularly in the, in the small percentage of people with GPA who do not have positive ANCA. And that's why it's very important uh, for the clinicians to recognize the clinical pattern, the subtle differences in the clinical symptoms in the two diseases uh, helps to differentiate the two conditions. And uh, fortunately, we have the ANCA test, uh, which is positive in most of the patients who have GPA. Uh, I have one last question. For those who can't access one of the programs, how can patients be more proactive in advocating for relevant treatment from their treating physicians? And how can patients and physicians access up-to-date information? Yeah, so I, that, that, thank you for your question, Isabel. There is a lot of different uh, vasculitis centers uh, around the country. So I, I believe that the rheumatologists that will have the most experience with relapsing polychondritis will be rheumatologists that are familiar with granulomatosis with polyangitis. 
Uh, and uh, so that would be a good place to start with if, if you cannot be evaluated in a center for, for relapsing polychondritis to go to a rheumatologist that has expertise in vasculitis. Uh, and we're always available. And uh, if there is any questions, uh, uh, the uh, PEN um, relapsing polychondritis program, uh, the physicians that are part of that program uh, can be available to answer any questions. And at NIH, we are also available and we do that very often. Uh, sometimes the physicians uh, will reach out to us uh, for recommendations and then we discuss the case. And many of the physicians uh, that I have talked to, they are very um, invested and really want to help the patients. So they are uh, up to date with, with the data. Uh, available for relapsing polychondritis. Uh, we, unfortunately, there is not a lot of new data coming up with, uh, a lot because again, it's a rare disease and then uh, we're still in the process of understanding and promoting research. Uh, but um, the American College of Rheumatology has a lot of resources and the physicians uh, usually uh, uh, look into that. Um, and for patients, uh, I think that uh, a way to advocate or look for information will be to look into the Vasculitis Foundation and the Relapsing Polychondritis Foundation, and they have very good resources about the disease. So for the patients joining the Vasculitis Foundation and the RP Foundation is, will be helpful. A lot of information uh, often posted. And uh, for physicians, as Dr. Ferrada mentioned, uh, we are available as uh, for consultation. And uh, for physician, obviously, you know, ACR has uh, multiple sessions on relapsing polychondritis, which are often helpful. As a patient with one of the rare diseases, I've found it very beneficial to be able to reach out with other patients that suffer from the same disease or in a peer-to-peer -peer group. Uh, do you see a benefit in patients being able to connect with each other through the foundations and the polychondritis foundation as well? Absolutely. And that was one of the reasons that we decided to talk about uh, GPA and RP in the same webinar, because we want you guys to get connected. And I think that that is extremely powerful to talk with another patient that has similar experiences to share the different, um, you know, uh, the goods and the bads and, and particularly the support. So I think that it is, is one of the ways that you could uh, help patients, your uh, peers. It will be by being there to answer questions and support them. Thank you, Dr. Marcy Ferrada, Dr. Sri Banerjee, Victor James, Isabel Bautista, Nancy Lynn, Dave Bamert, the Vasculitis Foundation, the Vasculitis Clinical Research Consortium, and my colleagues at the RP Foundation and Race for RP. We appreciate everyone who worked together to create this webinar. In closing, I thank all who facilitate research that will help patients by developing treatments and ultimately finding cures to debilitating diseases, including GPA, relapsing polychondritis, and related conditions. Please continue your outstanding efforts. We salute you for your expertise, commitment, generosity, and accomplishments. Bravo.